If you take your Bibles and turn to 2 Kings chapter 6, if you've been with us as we've been talking about the ministry of Elisha, you realize we've been talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that shines forth as we look at the ministry of Elisha and realize he's just the type. The, the anti-type, the reality, is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I said in announcement time, the things that we're studying, the miracles of Elisha, we're going to look at miracle number 12 and 13 today. And in both those miracles, you'll see something about the Lord Jesus Christ and about his coming, but not his lowly coming in his first birth, in his birth, I should say, uh, but his coming in power and great glory as he is going to return and bring salvation to this earth. He's going to save the nation of Israel because if we're back here in the book of Kings and we're learning about the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry, uh, his ministry to the nation of Israel, the gospel we're studying is the gospel of the kingdom. Not the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not the gospel of the grace of God that God has postponed the coming of Christ, the judgment that's going to precede that because we live in the day of grace and his cross has allowed God to postpone his wrath, postpone the second coming of Christ and, and not just deal with Israel but turn to the Gentiles in his grace and offer all mankind, Jew and Gentile alike, salvation through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but in, these, in the section of the Bible we're studying, the gospel of the kingdom has to do with Jesus Christ coming back to set up his kingdom as been promised from the very beginning. Back to Adam and Eve when they first sinned, back to Abraham when he gave him the land, back to David when he set him upon his throne, and uh, all pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ who will come back and reign. I'm going to read the first seven verses and see if you see the second coming of Christ in these seven verses. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 6 verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And, and uh, one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to, uh, to Jordan, they cut down wood. And as one was felling a beam, uh, the axe head fell, off, uh, fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him uh, the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in hither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up. To thee, and he put his, out his hand and took it up. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do pray that we might always, in every verse of Scripture, see your Son, his promises and fulfillment that will be accomplished for the nation of Israel, but always stop and glean about his accomplishments on the cross in our behalf. And may everyone here uh, understand and maybe hear again the gospel of your grace, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the payment for our sin. And so, Father, we pray our spiritual eyes will be open as we look at this passage of Scripture and see your Son. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, that's very obvious, is it not, uh, how that points to the Lord Jesus Christ? This is a passage of Scripture. I, I'm kind of anxious to preach on it. It's a passage of Scripture for years as I just would read the Bible through and not try to figure everything out that I would read that and I'd just scratch my head and say, what? <laughs> and, and just go on. But as you can see, as we've been looking closer at the events of Elisha, that we begin to see some things that uh, actually have spiritual answers to some of these events that we see taking place here. Uh, the twelfth miracle, uh, an iron axe head made to float. And, uh, it, and as I said, we, we see different things. First of all, we see uh, the Jordan River again. They're actually moving the, the sons of the prophets. They've been sitting around. Elisha has been teaching them. Uh, and apparently they might be growing in number because the place was too small. But don't forget as well, back a couple of miracles ago, we realized there's a drought going on. And if you move closer to the Jordan River, you've got more vegetation. And so they're moving closer to the, the Jordan River where perhaps they could... Uh, 
well, they, they can build shelter is what they're doing, and, and uh, perhaps find more food to eat, and so they move there, they ask Elisha to move with them, and so he does. Uh, and then as they were uh, hewing lumber down, um, an axe head fell off into the water, that verse 5, and he cried and he said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. Uh, the very fact that it was borrowed immediately takes you back to the, uh, the verses that, uh, in, in, under the law that state Exodus 22.14. It just states that if you borrow something from somebody and it gets destroyed, you have to replace it. And uh, so the axe is borrowed and he's going to have to replace this axe. Apparently he doesn't have the means of replacing the axe and, and, and therefore he knows under the law he's supposed to replace it. Um, it, also, there's, it's interesting in Deuteronomy 19, uh, it talks about if you were actually out in the woods and you were hewing tree and, uh, and the axe head fell off and hit someone and killed them, uh, that you're not you, you to run to the city of refuge, but you're not to be put to death because it was an accident. And it has nothing to do with this passage of scripture. I think more the fact he yelled that it was borrowed tells you that he's thinking about the law and he's got to replace this axe head. And, and then uh, here the uh, uh, Elisha just asks where it was, throws a stick in, and it says the, the, act, the iron, it's iron axe head, that it floated. Uh, so that uh, when you look at the Bible and you start looking at iron, iron in your Bible is also, is always used in almost every passage talking about strength. It's the hardest piece of metal. And, and so therefore, um, not, not only is it hard, it would sink, certainly, but uh, uh, when you talk about it, there's strength there. And so that's something to keep in mind as we, as we look at this, what's taking place here. Uh, what would help us, I believe, and as if you hold your place in Second Kings, if you come to Daniel chapter 2, there's different places when you think about an axe. I, I think about what uh, uh, John the Baptist said, Behold, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Uh, and, and that Jesus Christ is going to come back in judgment. And, and that would be fitting as well as we look at this illustration. But when you come to Daniel chapter 2, Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he's the first Gentile power that God has given world power, a world empire, into the hands of the Gentiles. It's the beginning of what the Bible calls the times of the Gentiles. Now, don't get that mixed up with the fullness of the Gentiles. That's in the age of grace, us getting saved and coming into our fullness. That would be at the rapture. But the times of the Gentiles is when Israel is going to be given over to Gentile uh, power and the Gentiles are going to rule over the nation of Israel until Jesus Christ comes and destroys the last Gentile power, uh, the, uh, the Antichrist kingdom. And right from the very beginning, as Nebuchadnezzar has taken... Um, the nation of Israel, the, the, even the southern two tribes, and has taken them captive. Daniel is among the captives, and he's in the king's court, and the king has a vision, and the vision, God's given Nebuchadnezzar an understanding of what's going to happen after, the, after, he has, after him, down through the future, all the way until the Lord Jesus Christ comes to reign. No man could tell that the king was wise enough to say to the, his, all his advisors, the soothsayers and all the magicians and everything else he had, he said, no, I'm not going to tell you the dream, I just need you to give me the interpretation. And they said, oh, no man's ever can do that, you've got to tell us the dream. And he was going to kill them all until Daniel prayed and God gave to Daniel the understanding of the dream Nebuchadnezzar had and the interpretation of the dream. In Daniel chapter 2, in verse 31, here's the, the dream. Uh, Daniel is now before the king and he says, Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. And this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The, his Im, his, uh, this image's head was of fine gold, his breasts and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs iron, and his feet part iron and part of clay. And thou sawest till the stone was cut out of the uh, cut out without hands, cut out of a mountain it is, uh, with and smote the image upon the feet that were iron and clay and break it into pieces. So he saw this image made up of these different metal materials until this 
rock that was cut out of the mountain, the stone, came and destroyed it. So here's the interpretation, verse 37. Thou, O king, art king of kings. For the, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, and the beasts of the field, and the fowls of heaven, hath he given into thy hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So now we know that Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar's reign over Babylon and over the earth it represents the head of gold. He says, And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. So that, that when we talk about the silver, the, uh, the breastplate of silver and the arms of silver, uh, we'll, we, if you study Daniel, you'd find out that's the Medes and Persian Empire that eventually conquered Babylon and reigned in its stead over all the nations of the earth. But then it goes on to say, and another third kingdom of brass. So the, the belly and the, and the thighs of brass is that third kingdom. That's Alexander the Great and his defeat of the Medes and Persian. And the Grecian Empire that ruled after him uh, shall bear rule over all the earth. Then we get down to verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. See the strength? If, did you notice that in all the different metals you got gold, you got silver, you got brass, and then you got legs of iron, and then finally it's iron and clay. When you get down to the iron and the iron and clay, you're talking about the strength. Gold is a very soft metal. And then as you keep going, each one is softer. Uh, or excuse me, each one is harder. Gold is the softest, iron would be the hardest. And uh, so you're getting harder and harder as you go. You also, you see that word inferior in verse uh, 29. Um, and, and in each one, gold is the most valuable. But it, there's a degression as it goes as far as value is concerned. Iron is cheap. Uh, gold is expensive. And, and, and so there's a deterioration uh, at the same time, an increase in strength as you go. Now, when you get to this fourth kingdom, um, I would, I would believe this is in the days when Jesus Christ was born and ministered that fourth kingdom is the Roman Empire. Uh, now some disagree with that. I had a man <laughs> call back when we taught the book of Daniel and he said, before I buy this series, I want to know what you think the, the, the iron legs are. And, uh, and I said, well, I think it's the Roman Empire. And, and he says, okay, that's all I need to know. I don't want to buy it. <laughs> There is another view about that because it ties into the Antichrist kingdom. But that's the difference between the iron and then the iron and clay. Um, I'll point that out as I read. Verse 40 says, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, as much as the iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as the iron that breaketh all things shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet of toes, uh, the, the feet and toes, part uh, Part potter's clay and part iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it the strength of iron, for as much as, uh, thou, uh, as, much as uh, thou sawest the iron mixed with the miry clay. I believe that the age of grace is between verse 40 and 41. That there is in the last empire the iron, the strength of iron, but it's mixed with miry clay, but it is strong. And... Uh, and the reason I say that is when you study Daniel, you start reading about the ten nations that are going to side with the Antichrist. He's going to conquer three, reign over ten. You read in the book of Revelation, seven heads, uh, ten crowns, seven heads. And that's all related to the Antichrist kingdom. So it, to me, it's very clear here that we're now talking about the Antichrist kingdom. In verse 42, it says, And as the toes of feet were part iron and part clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Interesting, you know, that you got ten nations confederate. Uh, there is always going to be some division between those nations. And that's the clay part of that. But there's also verse 43. And whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with the miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Who? Well, if you know anything about the future, Satan and his angels are going to be cast down, down to the earth. And that's when the Antichrist gains the power that he has over all the earth. When Satan is cast out, his angels are cast out with him. And they're strong, mighty angels. And, but they're mixed with man whose feet is made of clay. 
And, uh, and so there might be that the, the, the armies in the last is going to be both at the fallen angels with humanity going to fight against Jesus Christ upon his return. But, but verse 43 again it says, And whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with the miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as the iron is not mixed with the clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Here comes the second coming of Jesus Christ to establish his kingdom. For as much as thou sawest the stone was, that was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known unto the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. So as you see this iron, you're, uh, to me you're immediately of Daniel, and of course, uh, Daniel came along after 2 Kings, but in studying the Bible, it would make me to look at this piece of iron that floated, represent the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's going to destroy the Antichrist kingdom and set up his kingdom that's never going to be destroyed. Now, I think you'll see that as we kind of go back to the thought of 2 Kings. Because in 2 Kings, what you're just seeing here is something that's, that catches your eye because it's so contrary to nature. It defies the law of physics. It defies gravity. <laughs> it defies nature. That an axe head falling into water, you throw a stick in the water and an axe head swims. And, and so you're looking at something that, that is certainly supernatural. Now as we said all along, is when we're looking at the life of Elisha, we're seeing different things that would point us to the Lord Jesus Christ and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. But one of the things that hopefully you've noticed along the way is that if Elisha does a miracle, that miracle is not only superseded, but, but uh, uh, oh, more supernatural, and greater in the miracle that, it's a, that it appoints to Jesus Christ and what he did. What I mean by that is the second miracle that Elisha did is he took water that was contaminated and he made it drinkable. And we said, you know, the Lord did a, a miracle, but it was greater than that. Because the Lord took water and turned it into wine at a, at a marriage feast. And wine represents great joy. And it's one thing to have water to stain physical life. It's another thing to have the joy of spiritual life and eternal life that the Lord Jesus Christ provides. You know, the, another illustration that's very obvious, and that is Elisha took a hundred, uh, took... 20 loaves of bread, and he fed 100 men. The Lord Jesus Christ said, ah, that's nothing. He takes five loaves of bread and feeds 5,000 men. So you see that Elisha is just, he's just the type. He's just the shadow. The reality is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ supersedes anything that Elisha did because he is, he is the anti-type. He is the reality. Elisha is just pointing things toward him. So, in, in looking at this axe head floating, to me it's not hard to realize that there's been a miracle that the Lord Jesus Christ did that supersedes any la axe head, a piece of iron, floating, being able to float in water. Uh, you might recall what that is by now. Matthew chapter 14. It was in the first stanza of Carl's song. <laughs> Matthew chapter 14, in verse 22, this is right after the feeding of the 5,000. It says in Matthew 5, and, uh, no, Matthew 14, verse 22. It says, And straightway Jesus uh, constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitude away. And, he went, and when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. You know, you can't help but realize the Lord Jesus Christ in his ministry spent time alone with God the Father in prayer. He needed that for his ministry. And uh, we, we, we should never overlook prayer, communing with God, and the importance of that to our spiritual life. So the Lord goes up to pray, and when he was even, even was come, 
uh, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, and the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, that cry, uh, it is a spirit and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. But Peter answered him and said, Lord, if, <laughs> if it be thou, bid me to come to thee on the water. You know, if it wasn't the Lord, and, and the Lord's going to say, yeah, come, Peter. If it wasn't the Lord, what was going to happen to Peter? <laughs> he said, if it's you, bid me to come, verse 29. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink and cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately the Lord stretched out his hand and caught him and said unto him, O ye of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when he was come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. The Lord Jesus comes walking on water in a, in a storm. Even Peter says, If it's you, let me, let me come to you. Come on. And Peter comes out and walks on the water. But the illustration there is as Peter looks away from the Lord and starts looking at the sea and the waves and the wind, that he begins to sink and he yells, save me. And I love that word immediately. That's what God's waiting for everybody to do. To realize we can't save ourselves, we need the Lord to save us. And immediately the Lord caught him. Immediately the Lord saved him. When he called on the name of the Lord, he was saved. But then they that were in the ship realized who they're dealing with here that this was the Son of God. Now, by the way, just like Elisha makes me think of this passage, this passage has actually got a spiritual teaching to it. When you see the Lord coming to his disciples to save them, it is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ coming someday in the air to save the nation of Israel, coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Flip over to chapter 24. Matthew 24. It says in verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be sh shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So they're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ, and He's not just going to walk on water, He's going to fly through the air. He's going to, uh, Revelation chapter 19, He's going to be riding on a white horse. Here He's coming in the clouds of heaven. I guess a white horse looks like the clouds of heaven. And He's going to come back in power and great glory. He's defying all nature. In fact, in His coming and the judgments that take place before His coming, nature has gone chaotic. The winds, you talk about winds being boi uh, and the waves boisterous. In a time of tribulation, they're out in the sea as a picture of the nation of Israel going through that tribulation and they have to keep their eyes on the Lord in order to endure to the end where He's going to come back and save the nation of Israel upon His return. And He's going to come back not walking on water, He's going to come back in the air. And all of nature is going to be, everything happening is supernatural. Because He's changed everything. The Lord is the one who's in charge of nature. He's the one who's in charge of this earth. He is the Creator. He is the Son of God. And He's going to come back and save the nation of Israel. And that's what this is a picture of. That's why it reminds me of Daniel, who the God of heaven, the stone cut out of the mountain, is going to destroy the, the Gentile powers that have ruled. And Jesus Christ is going to come back and save the nation of Israel and set up His kingdom on this earth that shall never be destroyed. Initially, there's a thousand-year reign of Christ, but it goes on eternally after that. And so the, it's a picture of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. All that I see in an axe head floating in the water. <laughs> I always wondered what that was about, and I'm sure the interpretation is sure. <laughs> Go back with me now to 2 Kings chapter 6.
You could look at all that and say, Tom, you're kind of going mad here, but <laughs> I don't think so. The 13th miracle, at least as I numbered them, I'll talk about how people number them differently another time, but um, it's actually found in, in, in chapter 6 of 2 Kings, verses 15 through 17. I'm not even going to tell you what it is right now because I'd rather you lead up to it. And that is in verses 8 through 12 is going to set the scene for the next miracle that's going to take place. So let's deal with that first. In 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 8, it says, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In, as much, uh, in, such, in such a place shall be, shall be my camp. Now, you remember the king of Syria. This is the king that sent Naaman the Syrian <laughs> to the king of Israel to get healed of his leprosy. He eventually went to Elisha and was healed of the leprosy. And, uh, and so now all of a sudden the king of Syria is going to go to war against the nation of Israel. I don't know how much time has passed. I don't think much. And, uh, and one of the other things, I doubt if Naaman, who's the captain of the Syrian army, is involved in this campaign. Uh, we know that he realized that the God of Israel is the only true God. And I doubt if he's going to come and attack the nation of Israel after Israel became a blessing to him and he accepted the God of Israel as the true God. Now, I just say that because nothing's said about him. It's just that the king of Syria now has planned this attack. And when he planned this attack, there is a, like a, a secret battle plan that he has. That verse 8 says that he counseled with his servants. And he said, okay, I'm going to put my camp here. As if he's going to set up camp in a secret place that Israel won't know where he's at, and he could then uh, destroy the nation of Israel. That's the ten northern tribes, as we've been studying the ministry of Elisha. Uh, but what happens is Elisha spoils this man's plans. Verse 9, And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware, that thou pass not such a place. For hither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of it of and saved himself there not once nor twice. <laughs> so you're realizing that, that this man of God, which is Elisha, has warned the king of Israel, don't go to that place. And, and he spared him from being destroyed by the Syrians not one time, not two times. That means three or more times. So every time the, the, the king of Syria is planning to do something, it gets foiled. The plan gets spoiled because there's a prophet in Israel, Elisha, and he's warning the king. Well, the king doesn't know about that. So verse 11, it says, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for, his, for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of, which of us is for the king of Israel? Okay, I know there's a spy in the camp here. I know there's an agent who's, who's warning the king. Every time I set up a trap, he, he misses the trap. And uh, what do you guys confess? Who is it that's for the king of Israel? But the servants, they know. And I don't know if it's from, from Naaman coming back, but they know what's taking place here, and they tell the king, verse 12. And one of the servants said, None, that is, none of them are the spies, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchambers. <laughs> Woo wee! <laughs> they understand that it's Elisha the prophet. If he's a prophet, where's Elisha getting his information from? He's a prophet of God. He's getting information from God because God is protecting the nation of Israel from Syria who's trying to destroy them. And, and he's using Elisha the prophet to tell the king the, the plans. And, and whatever the king, the king could have a secret meeting in his bedchambers. And, and Elisha knows what he's, be, what he's saying because the God that, he, that Elisha serves is the God who knows all things. And he tell, he's telling Elisha, and Elisha's telling the king. Hold your place here, and come with me to Psalms 139. Popular passage of scripture. Good time to remind us of these things. Psalm 
Psalms 139. It says in verse 1, it says, O Lord, and this is David, he knows the Lord. O Lord, thou searcheth me and knoweth me. Thou hast searched me and, have, and know, known me. Thou makest my sitting, my, my down sitting, and my, thou knowest, boy, my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts, afar, my thought afar off. I've said to you before, when I read this, I don't think David is saying, you're way up there in heaven and I'm way down here and you know my thoughts. It could mean that. I think he's actually saying that before I even it goes in my head, you know what I'm going to think. Uh, my point is, God knows all things. And, uh, and what the king of Syria is planning to do, God knows those things. But verse 3 says, Thou compassest my path and my, my lying down. Thou art acquainted with all my ways. And there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, thou, hast, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and have laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain unto it. There's two things that David in those verses are talking about. There's the omnipresence of God. And he goes on to express how God's everywhere present. The king of Syria, God, God knows what's going on in that bedchamber. He's everywhere present. But there's not only the, the omnipresence of God, there's the omniscience of God. The knowledge of God, what God knows. And, and, and God knows all things. There is talk, and we've had it here at the church, about where people discuss what God knows and what he doesn't know. I actually think that's foolish talk. Who are human beings to talk about what God doesn't know? God knows all things, the Bible says. And uh, so my point is, is that king of Syria there, Elisha, the reason he can say he knows everything is God just tells him what the, what the, the king is planning. He could tell Elisha what the king, king is planning before the king plans it, plans it. So anyhow, God knows all things and, and reveals that. Now, by the way, why we're in this passage, we live in cruel times. People that don't turn to their Bible, don't read their Bible, don't have the values of God in their Bible, and therefore they ignorantly have some beliefs. And one of the things I want to point out to you, that if you read this passage of Scripture, you would not believe in abortion. Look down in, look down in verse 14. It says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret in the curi and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Now what David is describing is God's, God's thoughts toward David as he was just being developed in his mother's womb. That's what the secret place, that's what he's talking about, conception, and, and as he's starting to develop in the womb. Verse 16 says, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Wow. As that child's developing, God is keeping a record. You know, we, every time a baby's born, you count how many toes, how many fingers, see how whole it is. As, as David was developing in the womb, God's recording all these things. And so when you, when you look at a passage like that, you realize that you're messing around with something that God is making in a womb, a developing, and that God has knowledge of and God's keeping record of. And it, it ought to scare someone who would think that abortion is a, a choice that they could make, no matter what government says, people who ignore the Bible say. It, it, as, you know, as you read on, you would also learn not to use the Lord's name in vain. Verse 18, if I should count them, they are more than numbered. That's the thoughts, the sum of God's thoughts toward us. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. 
Surely thou shalt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. He's separating from lost men, from, from sinners. Verse 20, For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine uh, enemies take thy name in vain. God's name is to be glorified, not taken in vain. And yet we live in a society that thinks nothing of using the Lord's name in vain. And when you know the Lord has these thoughts toward you, so David concludes in verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. The Lord searches the heart, but that's a, really an invitation for you to search your own heart as well. And those evil ways, get them out of your system. That's not the way that God would have us to live. Get them out of your mind, out of your thoughts. So anyhow, that, I, I turn to that passage because the king of Syria, he, he doesn't know who the spy is, and the spy is God, <laughs> telling Elisha, the prophet, what's happening. So at this point, going back to 2 Kings, now we get to the miracle, almost. What happens here is the king turns his attention away from the nation of Israel, and he says, okay, if Elisha's the problem, we've got to get rid of Elisha. So verse 13, it says, and he said, go and spy where he is, that is, where is Elisha, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. You know, everything that we're reading, you can just dig and dig and dig. Every time we read about Elisha, we're always given a location of where he's at. And so I see Dothan, and I thought, well, just think, what else does the Bible say about Dothan? It's only mentioned one other time in Scripture. I think it's Genesis 37, where Joseph was going to see his brothers after he had a vision that his brothers would bow down and worship him. And his brothers are out keeping sheep and his dad sends him to his brother and his brothers were in Dothan and they see him coming. And they, con the Bible says, conspired against him. <laughs> Just like the king, conspiring against Elisha. And, and they thought they were going to, at first they were going to kill Joseph. Then what, they sell him as a slave and he ends up in Egypt, comes in second in command of all of Egypt, saves the nation of Israel from, from uh, the famine, the seven years of famine that they're going through, and his brothers, who don't realize who he is, come and bow down before him. Just amazing how God's word, just what God says happens. Uh, so anyhow, <laughs> I just, that's a quick <laughs> side trail there. But verse 14. Therefore he, that's the king of Syria, uh, therefore sent he hither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and encompassed the city about. <laughs> Did you catch all that? Horses, chariots, and a great host. They're sneaking up by night and uh, all for one man, <laughs> a man of God. You know, when, when the king of Israel sent men to go get Elijah, Elijah just said, uh, let fire come down from heaven and consume them, and they're gone. <laughs> if these guys knew who they were dealing with, they, they would realize that uh, they can't sneak up on him. Anyhow, verse 15 says, And when the servant of the man of God, now apparently Gehazi, who got leprosy, is no longer the servant. He is, he's still alive. He shows up later in scripture. But, but uh, it looks like Elisha has a new servant. And the servants with him, and it says, When the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, the host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And a servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? So this guy's scared. He realizes that that host is after them. You know, I look at that in my mind when I read the verse. He says to his master, how shall we do? I'm thinking, what shall we do? But he didn't say, what shall we do? He said, how shall we do? And that doesn't kind of, that sounds kind of funny. Now, it might mean, what should we do? But it might mean, how shall we do? You're a prophet of God. How are we going to turn out? How are things going to end? <laughs> because that's what he's about to learn. Verse 16 says, And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now, you know, you'd have to scratch your head if you were that guy and say, 
uh, one, two, <laughs> horses, chariots, a great host. Uh, how, do you, how do you come to that conclusion? So Elisha prays for him in verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was filled, was full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. Elisha knew they were there. God, angelic host. You think you're worried about a Syrian guy coming to get you? Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes. And the Lord opened his eyes, and he realized when he said chariots of fire, do you remember when that term was used before? When Elijah was caught up by that whirlwind? It says it came to pass as they went still and talked that behold there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them asunder and Elisha went up by the whirlwind into heaven and El Elijah went up by the whirlwind of heaven and Elisha saw it and cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. That, those chariots of fire, those horses of fire, are God's protective uh, army, the host of heaven, protecting the nation of Israel from the, the Syrians. But here he's protecting Elisha, the prophet. And that's why Elisha could say, Great, they're more with us than with them. And there's no comparison of the strength of the army, because those are mighty angels that are standing there that are ready to protect them. Now we're not going to see. Now that, that's the... Just the opening the eyes of the servant is the 13th miracle. We're not going to cover what happens at this point. Uh, you're going to have to come back uh, in January. <laughs> and uh, the first couple weeks of January, we'll take uh, miracle number 14, 15, and then the last of all, we'll take miracle number 16. But at this point, he's opened his eyes, he sees that. You know that they're going to get spared. What's going to happen will be in our, our, pre, our next studies. But you can see that he's going to be st spared because God is going to protect them. There's a couple things that you need to know about that. And that is, in God's dealings with the nation of Israel, the kingdom is going to be established here on earth. We've already read about Jesus Christ coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. We know, if you come with me, the last verse we're going to look at, might as well turn there now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And Paul's talking about the second coming in this passage of Scripture. But I first I want to state this, because a lot of people read that angelic host and immediately think, oh, wow, God has angels protecting us wherever we go. Israel was God's earthly people, God has a purpose for the nation of Israel in the earth. He has a purpose of setting Israel up as a, a, as a kingdom in the earth. And Jesus Christ reigning through the nation, in the nation of Israel, from Jerusalem over all the earth. So the angels, in, in their use and ministry to the nation of Israel, God used angels to protect the nation of Israel to bring about what he is planning to do with the nation of Israel. But when you study Paul's epistles and what God's doing with us as members of the body of Christ, our battle is not a physical battle, but it's a spiritual battle. It's not against, uh, it's not against the nations of the earth, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. The weapons of our warfare are not natural weapons. They're not physical weapons. They're not made out of metal and things like that. The, our, 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 the, our weapon is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And we need not to, an angelic host. We have the, the indwelling Holy Spirit with the Word of God to guide us in life. And, and when I say that, I, I, I say that knowing that if you go through church history, there's been many, many believers that have been persecuted and killed with no protection from God. Every once in a while you read someone got out of some kind of trouble, but martyrs down through the ages... And martyrs to this day, you just don't read about them too often, that are in lands where it is either where evil uh, men who are false religion would attack anyone that names the same name of Christ and kill them. Afghanistan, all the, those things are happening all the time. China, people are in prison, killed, some are tortured. So these things happen all the time. There is not guardian angels. 
But we have God's word and we realize that we're not really dealing with men. That the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're spiritual to the pulling down of strongholds. Our weapon, our, our warfare is to get the word of God out to lost people so that they can hear God's word and be saved. And, and we don't have to worry about the physical things in life because if we die, Paul says, for me to die is gain. For you, it's more needful, but for me to die is gain. So we go through life with a different attitude than the nation of Israel. That's really important because some people read that about Elisha and immediately think, oh, we got guardian angels. There's no, nowhere does Paul teach that. In fact, he says, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So the more you speak up for the Lord, the more you live for the Lord, the more you'll suffer, even to the point of death. And that, that's a fact. That's the difference between the dispensation of God's dealing with us and, and God's dealing with the nation of Israel. But here it ties together. 2 Thessalonians chapter uh, 1 Paul's talking about the Thessalonians who are suffering in the age of grace for their faith. And he says in verse 5, he says, Which is a, a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer, seeing that it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation on them that trouble you. Right now God's not recompense, paying back, tribulation on them that trouble us. But there's coming a time that God's going to flip and turn things around. Look at verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a time we suffer now, but it's going to get flipped when Jesus Christ returns with his mighty angels, taking vengeance on them that know not God. God will someday judge this world. And, and what, that, what that young man saw is the armies of heaven. And someday God will use those in the second coming of Jesus Christ and will be taking vengeance on the nations of this world. Verse 9 says, Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. When all that happens, we're going to be resting with Christ. When the vengeance is poured out on this earth. That's the rapture. And then His judgment falls on this earth. And then during that time, that's when you see like the Lord coming in the troubled sea and the believing remnant of Israel looking for the Lord to help them, to feed them, to protect them. During the tribulation, he'll do that because that's his calling. That's his promise to them under the law. Elisha, we saw the borrowing. They're living under the law. And under the law, God says to the believing remnant of Israel that he would protect them and, and to the bad part of Israel, the evil, that he's going to curse them as he is going to curse the nations of this earth. But all this takes place, as it says in verse 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. Now his saints include the saints of Israel and the body of Christ. Watch this. And to be admired in all them that believe. Now skip the parentheses. To be admired in all them that believe in that day. So when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe in that day. So he's coming back and he's going to be glorified. But the parenthesis says, because all his saints, it says, because our testimony among you was believed. So not only will he come back and save the nation of Israel in his coming back, those of us in this age of grace who have heard the gospel of grace from the Apostle Paul, we who have believed the gospel, we get the rest with Christ when all this vengeance takes place. And he's going to be glorified in us as well as the nation of Israel because that's his purpose and, and it's because we believed. The gospel message, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Just like when he comes back, there's a verse that says, He alone will tread the winepress of the wrath of God. You don't need those mighty angels. He can do it by himself, but they're coming with him. So it is that when it came to our salvation, he alone provided salvation. He alone went to the cross and died on the cross 
alone, cut off even from God the Father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? To bear our sins, and he completely paid for our sins, rose from the dead to become our Savior, and when we believe on him, we're saved, and he's going to be glorified in us someday. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. We'll continue with Elijah and Elisha in a couple weeks. Um, not so much Elijah anymore, but Elisha, and finish up our studies there. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for allow us and allowing us to see some things with spiritual eyes, just like the young man who didn't realize what was standing out there behind the Syrian army in the mountain. And it was your, your chariots of fire, your horsemen. Father, we, we thank you that today, uh, by your grace, we can be saved, look forward to your Son being glorified in us now and for all eternity. But Father, we have, just like Israel had your word by their prophet, we have your word by our apostle. And we can know what you're accomplishing today and what you're able to do in us. And as the Apostle Paul writes us and said, it warns us and says, if God be for us, who could be against us? Only men could ever do anything against us. But Father, we thank you for our eternal security. We thank you for our eternal rewards. We thank you for our, 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 our eternal life that's in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's his name that we pray and give our thanks. Amen.